Would you happen to know why in particular Dave Grohl loves Sound City Studios as much as he does? I know his relationship with Sound City goes way back to the Nirvana Nevermind days, of course. I think, uh, well, one, yeah. So, yeah, Nevermind was tracked there and that Neve desk. And, you know, there was another Neve desk very similar at a place called Grandmaster. But it wasn't the same. And it wasn't the same control room. There's, there was a magic between that drum room and that desk. And uh, so I think Dave, I mean, like, Sound City wasn't super expensive. And, you know, they didn't upgrade to SSL because they couldn't afford it. So that kind of, like, created a niche for them accidentally because all of a sudden they're stuck with this, you know, 28-input console. It's like, you know, this giant built-like-a-tank thing. And uh, everyone's moving over to SSL and, like, you know, lots of, you know, routing and, uh, you know, just feature, you know, rich console. Uh, but, you know, hey, you can get into the studio and get world-class sounds for, you know, a, a decent amount of money. Like, not, you know, you're not, you're not paying $2,000 a day to get into this place. So that might have been a cool thing. He did a band called Verbena there that turned out pretty good. Um, and then he brought in Rye Coalition. I don't know if you ever got into them. Uh, and he would just keep coming back. So, you know, if you needed drums and a great drum room, that was the place to go. And he's a drummer, a great one too. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was speaking with uh, Steve Albini a little while back, and he said that he thinks Dave Grohl is one of the best drummers ever. Like, period. Like, he really felt very strongly yeah. about that. Yeah. And um, so I was speaking with Chris Sheldon, as I mentioned, the one of the mixers from the Foo Fighters' "Color and the Shape" record. He said that um, for I believe the song "My Hero," they recorded the drums in like an empty parking garage or something, like so they can get that really big ambient sound. Yes. Mm hmm. Has there ever been any kind of funky thing like that you've done to get like a specific sound when you're recording? Well, uh, no, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, I've done things where uh, I'm in a warehouse. It gets pretty splashy. But then if you want to get really creative, uh, you know, using a big garage door that, you know, for the warehouse as a percussion instrument. And that's fun, too. Then you just crush that thing and, you know, stretch it out if you want. Just It just sounds otherworldly. Yeah, yeah. That's, that, I never even thought about that. I'm going to give it a shot after this. <laughs> <laughs> what exactly is the current state of Sound City? Well, the Sound City I was part of isn't around any longer. So that Sound City's gone. The desk is at Dave Grohl's. Uh, most of the gear got sold off, you know, on eBay to whoever. Um, but uh, then they... Uh, this guy Kevin Agunis came in and changed you know he, the space was still there the space never disappeared uh, so you still have a control room and a tracking room uh, and uh, he, he put in you know some tube Altec desk and he had you know all this like you know, 50s and 60s type equipment which was okay but there's a reason why people don't go all the way that far back to create records um but you know uh so then that guy left and then some other guy came in and it was sound city 2.0 and he brought in a couple of helios desks which are interesting that's all right well that's a, a step in the right direction and then so they had a falling out so uh the the property owners sandy skeeter who who took over after her dad passed he owned the whole complex uh now there's a Sound City is back. They've got a Neve desk or a Neve type desk in there, and but it's a uh, it's uh, Blake Mills and Tony Bird, so uh, they're keeping the place busy just with their own projects. So uh, like I was trying to get a band in there, uh, like right after they they got in, I'm like, hey, I just need like four or five days to track drums, you know. It'd be great to hear what this desk sounds like in that room. I, you know, I've been here for a while. I, I'm, I'm curious, and it's, it's nice to come back. And Tony is like, you know, absolutely, you know, whatever you want, big. And I'm like, great. And then I get a call. Like nobody got back to me until like three months later. Hey, that time is booked. And I was just like, oh, it's okay. I got that sorted out. But that's where I'll, I'll go if I need to record, you know, big drums. I'll go to Dave Grohl's studio because I can still get in there. Now that everything's become so digital, do you need like a good mixing board to, to make a good mix or is that getting more passe nowadays? It's now for, for tracking, you're going to, you're going to always want a desk for me, at least it's, I'm going to always want to like, you know, bust things or, uh, 
be able to monitor in real time on the desk instead of having to grab a mouse and like, oh, hey, all hell's breaking loose. Hold on two seconds. Uh, having the desk for tracking is pretty important. Now for mixing, you know, if you can afford to get into a room and your client has enough money to pay for you and the studio, hey, great, get in there. Otherwise, it's like, uh, all right, let's create a hybrid setup that can go mobile. Uh, it's going to be a lot of routing in the box, but at the same time, I've got like a rack full of outboard gear that I use to bring in the analog elements, and it just helps make things wider and less sterile. Does that make sense? I don't know if if, you, if you're not into recording. No, no, I'm I'm a so I'm a filmmaker, but I, but I've been around music for years, so I do have like somewhat of an understanding. But okay, got it. But but the, the mixing board, I've always I've never fully understood the boards. So I'm trying to learn more about that, right? Because it's like, yeah. For example, I saw the one, um, like one of the classic album docs where Butch Vig was talking yeah. about how he made Nevermind, and he was showing how on one of the tracks, Dave Grohl's vocals are like underneath Kurt's, and he was pressing buttons on the mixing board to just highlight that one element. So I was always curious, like, how do you get that one? How do you get like a button to stand for this is Jerry Control's voice and then this is William's voice? Like is that easy to program like that? Oh well so it's it's basically laid out on how your tape is playing back. So you got a twenty four track machine in the machine room spitting out twenty four channels. And he's, that spreads out from channel one to twenty four on your console. So alright, well Kurt's voice is on twenty two and Dave's is on twenty three or twenty five or you know, wherever if you have Pro Tools it's gonna be more than twenty five twenty four. Uh, if you have two tape decks up to 48 channels or tracks um, so it's just it, you know for tape it's easy it's just it's numbers it's like one through how, where, how many ever cha- tracks you have on tape uh, Pro Tools alright well okay so hey one through 12 are going to be all drums the next four are going to be uh, bass so that's just IO you know set up you know, you just, you know, routing, you know, your channels to certain channels in Pro Tools to actual physical channels on a desk. Oh, very cool. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So, but everything's out of, everything's out of hardware wire. So it's like, hey, I want this vocal to go out channel 14, which is also the same, the wire 14 goes to the channel 14 on the desk. That makes sense. Okay, cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so do you prefer working with analog or digital when you have the option? Well... I, I, I like working with analog front end. Now, tape is is fun. I don't think people can afford it. It's, you know, it, it, the time it takes to get the tape, you know, well, one, sourcing the tape, and then, you know, getting it aligned and, you know, getting your record, your record pad di- dialed in and, you know, setting your uh, your bias and that whole thing and aligning it. All right, great. Now you've got you've got your tape. Now you're recording on it. You do a pass. Oh, great. Can we do? It's like okay, yeah, we can, but we got to rewind first. Okay, now we're back. And you know, and it's it, 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 it it's 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 a kind of a cool workflow if you have the time to do that. But otherwise, it's like people, you know, budgets are small now, and it's like all right, well, all right, let's do. We're going we're gonna to start again from the top. Everybody ready? Yep, let's go. Boom. And you're, you know, as soon as you make that announcement, they're back in the game. Uh, having to stop and rewind, you know, it only takes like, you know, maybe 30 seconds or a minute tops, to, depending on how long the song is. But uh, I, I prefer digital just for that. You can work quick. Yeah, I agree. And so in terms of Dave Grohl, a producer that's worked extensively with the Foo Fighters is Nick Rasky Lennitz. And Nick, of course, has also worked with Alice in Chains. So how did your relationship start with Nick Raskulinitz? How did you start your relationship with Nick? Okay, so uh, we're both Sound City guys. And so, and then, you know, back to, you know, my, how I came up into music and to doing this. Amen, we're at Sound City recording their third record, the second record for Virgin. And, uh, you know, the singer was just hopped up on goofballs and drinking his own Kool-Aid and you know, uh, things came to a head and I was like, all right, well then I'm done. And, you know, I, I was, you know, talking with the studio manager, Siobhan O'Brien about, you know, interning or getting hired. And, you know, she's like, you know, all right, well you can start when these guys leave. And so 
I just, you know, I went from Virgin Records to the runner desk and uh, just, you know, read manuals, like just watched and listened and asked questions when I could. Um, and then, you know, became an assistant engineer. And then Nick came back, you know, he had already gone freelance because he did, you know, uh, food's record one by one. And, and uh, he was working with this band. I want to say they were, they were called the Xies anyways. You know, I came in, I was, you know, serious attention to detail. My documentation was spot on and, you know, him and, you know, just helping him and the engineer make the most of their time at Sound City. And, uh, you know, that then his, uh, his engineer quit. And from then on, he, he called me and was like, hey, Fig, you know, you want to come help me record, you know, I went from Sound City to, you know, start going freelance with Nick. We've been working ever since. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe for more because there is a lot more to come. All the videos on my channel are original. I'm the one filming, editing, and conducting all the interviews. So if you guys like what you see and you want to support, the best way to do so is honestly just to subscribe. Thanks for watching.